Well, we're going to continue our study of uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, uh, picking it up at verse 27 today. Um, and uh, let's start out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for gathering us together in your presence. Uh, your mercies are new every morning, and we rejoice and give thanks for the mercies that you have poured out upon us on this day. Uh, we pray that uh, now you would deal with us uh, based on the mercy that comes through your word, the mercy of Jesus Christ, and that uh, through this you would strengthen our faith, that you would guide and direct us according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And then we have handouts in here and one in your office. I don't know. I, I, uh, I, I've, I've thought about kind of putting those together again. I know those can be helpful and useful and kind of keep me on track. Uh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, so as I said, we're picking it up in verse 27, but just a reminder of, of uh, kind of the, the overall flow. So this is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And if we, if we look at this as a, uh, as a sermon or as, a, uh, as kind of one unit, we're now kind of in the body of, the, of his presentation. So um, the first uh, 20 verses were really kind of introductory in many ways and, and served as the foundation and the introduction. And then last week in verse 21, we really uh, kind of got into, into now the, the body of his presentation. And, and that's really going to last uh, the rest of chapter five uh, through chapter six and the first half of chapter seven is kind of all now um, the, 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 what we would look at as the body of the presentation. And in that, he's really saying, here's, here's how you live your life as a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? Here's what that looks like to, uh, to live out the faith and, and to be uh, an active member of, of living out that faith. And, and so last week in verse 21, he uh, uh, started with the topic of, of murder in the commandments. But then, um, as he said earlier in chapter five, that he came to be the fulfillment of the law, right? That um, not that he came to bring a new law or change the law, uh, but to fulfill the law. And so he he kind of fills it out is the way to look at it, right? So he filled out uh, what murder means from God's perspective being more than just the act of murder, but also the attitude of the heart, right? And he does the same thing here now. In fact, throughout this whole section, he kind of follows the same pattern. And so so we'll, we'll pick it up there in verse 27. <clears throat> Jesus says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And as we look at this verse here, he starts out with the you have said, but I tell you. And throughout this section, that's the way Jesus is going to be um, kind of be introducing things here, right? Um, you, you have heard, but I tell you. You have heard, but I tell you, all right? And remember, we, we covered last week when Jesus says, you have heard, he's talking about what they've heard from the teachers of the law, okay? Um, Jesus is not directly quoting scripture here, although sometimes in the things he says, he's, uh, scripture is quoted, but he's not directly quoting scripture. He's quoting the teachers of the law who also happen to be quoting, quoting scripture, okay? And so here in this case, that the you have heard uh, what was said is you shall not commit adultery. Um, <clears throat> okay, so if that's what the teachers of the law are saying, how does that compare with what God says? Are they getting it right? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, Exodus chapter 20, sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. So yeah, we'd look at that and say, yeah, the teachers of the law are getting it right. But <laughs> remember, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And so he's come again to kind of uh, fill it out and to give us the full picture of what, what it means, right? And so, but I tell you, he adds uh, He adds to that. And, and what does he add to the act of adultery. The attitude of the heart. 
right? The attitude of the heart. He, that's exactly what he did with murder in the, in the last verses we looked at last week, right? It was, he says, it's not just the final action of, of actually taking someone's life um, that is, uh, that, that's wrong, but it's, it's the attitude that leads up to that, right? The attitude of anger that leads up to taking the life. Same thing here with adultery. He says, it's not just the final act of adultery that is, that is wrong, but it's the attitude that leads up to that. Um, and that, and that with, uh, the case of adultery is the attitude of, of lust, right? And says, all of that begins in the heart. And that's really through this whole section, that's really what Jesus is doing is he's taking, taking the actions of the law, right? The letter of the law that says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, very action oriented. And he says, all these actions are actually a matter of what's going on in your heart, right? They're a matter of what's going on in your heart. Um, Jesus makes that a little more clear in Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse 18 to 20, he says this, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. Right? They come from the heart. Um, and from the heart come the evil thoughts. From the evil thoughts come then the actions that Jesus lists here. Right? But it starts with, starts with the heart. So as Jesus puts this spin on adultery, what does it do uh, kind of to those who are listening to him speak, you think? Those who are listening to this message. I think it makes them stop and think about what's in their heart. Yeah. Uh, what they're thinking and trying to do better. Here in Matthew, you know, it adds uh, sexual immorality in there with the adultery. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would make them stop and think, okay, what's going on in my heart, right? And, and, and probably, uh, whether it's this one or one of some of the other ones that Jesus is going to mention, one of them is going to like hit them right in the heart. And like, uh oh, that describes me, you know. <clears throat> um, and, and, and I think that's important, right? Because so often it's easy for us to look at the outward actions. Well, I'm not as bad as that person, right? Because look at what they do, you know, and you can see what they do. And I'm not as bad as that. Um, but, uh, but Jesus, you know, here saying, no, it's, it's not just about what you do. It's about what's in your heart. And so you are just as bad as that. But now he's still talking to the disciples. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember. I don't think at that time any of them uh, were married. Um, we don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, if they are married, they, they left their wife at home to yeah. follow Jesus, which okay. maybe wasn't the kindest <laughs> thing to do. Uh, yeah, but we I don't know for sure. I was going to look in my Bible because I didn't think defile was the word that was in my Bible. And that's not the correct place. Matthew 10, 18. Did I, did I give you the wrong reference there? Um, it wouldn't be the first time I did that. 10, 18, and you will be dragged before governors and kings. For my sake, no, that's yeah. that's not quite it. That is not it at all. See the word defile. It is supposed to be. Uh... Sorry. Um. That, unfortunately, that's what I wrote in my notes here too. It's not 10 at all. I mean, 10 is the absolute wrong chapter because he's not talking about that in this chapter. So I apologize. I, I'd have to go back and find what chapter that's from. Sorry about that. Yeah, your chapter 10 verse 18 says something totally different, doesn't it? Yeah, the places I would normally look to, to see, it's not there. Because <laughs> a lot of times I just, I'll flip a, you know, it'd be, I'll just flip numbers backwards or whatever, but. 
do a quick search and I can find it for you. Speak of the devil. Hi, Glenn. Good morning. Are you, are you referring to 1989 about detox Oh, no, we'll get to that later. Yeah, um, we'll look at that one later. Where is that? Is that Bible verse up there? Where is that? It's not Matthew 10 18. I'm looking for some of the people. Where? We're testing you this morning, Glenn. <laughs> 15 is the chapter. 15. Uh, and the zero and the five are nowhere near each other on a keyboard, so I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, see, I was wrong about even questioning the word. <laughs> and after all, you're said to file after all. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and, and again, the point is, right, it's a matter of the heart. And when it's a matter of the heart, right, I mean, think about it. The, the external stuff can sometimes be easy. Well, maybe not easy. Easier than the stuff of the heart, right? I, I mean, think of, think of um, how often you have, uh, for example, held your tongue and you haven't spoken those words of anger or frustration you really wanted to speak, but what's going on in your heart at that time, ah, right? Um, yeah, so when it, when it comes to the heart, it's much more difficult for us to, to do those things. And so Jesus, I, I think, you know, kind of going back to the, the whole beginning of this Sermon on the Mount and, and how he's addressing them, or um, Jesus is giving us as his disciples um, a way of life that is higher, so to speak, or maybe more difficult than that of the teachers of the law. Because the teachers of the law were just concerned about what you look like on the outside. You know, if you get it right on the outside, you're good to go. Uh, but, uh, but Jesus here has a higher set of expectations for his people. So any other thoughts on uh, 27 and 28 and Jesus... Uh, kind of view of adultery and that being in the heart. Okay. So in 29, I think he's uh, then uh, kind of builds on, on, uh, on what he says and, and here gives the, the consequences if, if you're not following this, right? If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Um, so first the word stumble there. Uh, in, uh, in Greek, the, the word stumble is skandalizo the word we get scandal or scandalize from, right? Um, and, and Matthew uses this word more than any other writer of the New Testament, right? And most of the time when Matthew uses the word, um, uh, it, it, it means not just, uh, oh, I have a little stumble and so I stand up and I keep going and I'm okay, but, but literally falling away from the faith is the way that Matthew uses this. So it's not just a, um, you know, a little stumble, but this is you completely fall away from the faith, all right? This is the same word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, right? So he calls it a stumbling block to the Jews, the cross of Christ. When he says that 
and so it's very clear there, right? It, from uh, from a, a Jewish perspective, or from those he's talking about there, the Jews, this stumbling block is not just something that oh makes them stub their toe and 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 uh, you, you know lose their balance for a second, right? Uh, but it's no big deal; they'll get back on track. No, the Jews are completely off track. The Jews are lost. They're beyond salvation. They're beyond hope. Uh, from that perspective, right? And so, um, so this word is one that really, especially in, in Matthew's gospel, he's talking about if, if you stumble, he's talking about you completely fall away from the faith, you're completely disconnected to God, and, and therefore liable to his punishment and to his judgment, right? And we kind of see that here as he talks, you know, there at the end of each of these verses about, about going into, about hell being cast into hell. So we kind of see the connection there between stumbling and judgment, okay? So, so I think the NIV could maybe pick a stronger word because stumble doesn't sound like a big deal to us, right? I mean, stumble is like, oh, okay, I just stumbled and, and now I'm okay. No, what Jesus is talking about here is not okay. This is completely falling from the faith and judgment. If your right eye causes you to sin, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And is this what some people use as um, self martyrdom? You know how some, especially in Bible times, people would um, bodily harm themselves. Yeah. For, for sin. This almost seems like an argument for that. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, and, and the question is, is Jesus here advocating, what would we call this, self-mutilation? Yeah. If you just take this verse as at a literal reading, that is really what it sounds like, isn't it? Um, but I think if you uh, kind of take this verse, kind of understand what Jesus is saying here overall in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's really using a point of exaggeration, right? And, and there are points where Jesus talks in points of exaggeration, right? He says things that are uh, obviously uh, not true or expected to be true in order to drive home a point, in order to make a point. Um, and this is one of those cases of exaggeration. Jesus is not advocating self-mutilation here. Um, if that were the case, uh, most of us would be walking around with no eyes and no arms and no limbs, and right? If we were to literally follow this, at, like the letter of the law, like Jesus is giving you a prescription, you know, if if you, uh, you know, if you look at a woman lustfully, take your eye out, right? We'd have a whole bunch of blind people walking around. The other eye's got to take over. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so this is just a point of exaggeration, is all it is. Yeah. And, and he's literally saying, you know, it would be better for you to start taking up body parts than to go to hell. And, and would it? Absolutely. I mean, and from that sense, yes, it would be, right? But Jesus is not suggesting we start doing that sort of thing. He's just emphasizing how, uh, you know, we should do whatever we can to avoid the fires of hell, right? And, and how important that is and how serious he takes sin. So other thoughts or questions on that part? Verse 31 then, Jesus goes on. And, and here I, um, I think is, is kind of now a continued discussion on the whole uh, topic of adultery that Jesus brought up in, in 27, kind of from a slightly different perspective. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. <clears throat> Again, Jesus is quoting the teachers, right? Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Um, and, uh, you know, we've kind of been asking ourselves, are they right in saying that? Now, the first couple Jesus quoted were easy for us, right? Those were the Ten Commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery. We know those ones. Those are, we're okay there. Uh, but this is actually a quote also of the Old Testament. It's a quote of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 24. 
Um, if a man marries a woman, uh, the law says back in Deuteronomy, who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes, a, writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. Okay. And so, yes, the law, uh, the Old Testament law, did talk about writing a certificate of divorce and the need to do that. Um, he goes on from there about other rules about how that works and what that looks like. But yes, um, that was a thing um, uh, about uh, uh, there in the Old Testament, this, this idea of this certificate of divorce. And that's, uh, and that's what Jesus, uh, that's what the teachers are quoting. They're quoting that verse from Deuteronomy. You should give her a certificate of divorce. Are they right in that? Yes, they're right in that. Okay. The problem is they were, the, the teachers of the law in Jesus time were so focused on what's the right way to divorce someone that they forgot to talk about the issue of divorce altogether. Right. <laughs> They forgot to talk about the merits of divorce and is divorce a, a good thing and a godly thing, right? They just had kind of put that whole part of the discussion on the shelf and they were just talking about, well, if you're going to get a divorce, you got to do it the right way. And in some ways, that's not too different from um, sometimes what we hear in modern times, right? You know? I'll do it the right way. Make sure you're civil to each other and, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, you do it the right way for the kids and you treat each other well, you know, those, and now those are good things, right? I mean, it's, they'll do that. You want to be civil and <clears throat> treat each other well and all that kind of stuff, right? But it avoids the question uh, of the, the issue of divorce in the first place. Does that make sense? Um, and that's what they were doing. They were avoiding the question of divorce in the first place. Okay. And Jesus brings that up, right? Um, here in these verses. And what is, what is Jesus' view of divorce here? Well, divorce is sin. Yeah. The Bible says God hates divorce. Right. And ultimately, I think that's what Jesus is saying here, too. Yeah. Is that divorce is, is sin, right? Uh, he, he, um, he uh, Jesus, on a couple of occasions, he does not Matthew 19, we'll look at that too, um, um, makes an exception for divorce, right? In, in the translation here, except for sexual immorality, um, uh, literally probably a, a sexual uh, or adultery uh, would, be, uh, would be a good translation there too, right? Um, some, uh, some Bibles translate this as, as uh, in fact, the old NIV translated it as marital unfaithfulness. Okay, which I, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad translation, but what's, um, what, what's the kind of difference between marital unfaithfulness and sexual immorality? It could be a big difference, right? Um, I mean, someone could describe just about anything as marital unfaithfulness. They didn't do what I wanted or, you know, whatever they didn't, you know, they, they broke their marriage contract because they did X, Y, and Z. And you can fill in just about anything in that blank there for marital unfaithfulness. And I think that's part of how we sometimes justify that today is, is we um, take a translation like marital unfaithfulness and we make that, can make that really broad, right, to justify just about anything. Um, when scripture is pretty narrow, you know, except for sexual immorality, except for cases of adultery, yeah. Um, and Jesus talks about that, like I said, in Matthew 19 as well, four through six. Now here, um, Jesus is addressing not his disciples, but he's addressing those teachers of the law. Remember, the Pharisees came and asked Jesus, point blank, is it, Jesus, is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? And this was Jesus' response. Haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So through those words, Jesus is saying divorce is not part of God's plan. Divorce was not God's plan for marriage. From the very beginning, divorce was not God's plan uh, for marriage. That was not God's desire. Right? Um, and then, I don't know if you remember the, the response the teachers of the law had to Jesus. Well, then why did Moses 
to command them to have a certificate of divorce. They brought up that same verse Jesus talked about back in Matthew. Um, you know, if they're not supposed, because they heard, they heard when Jesus said this, they heard you shouldn't be getting a divorce. Well, then why did Moses say they thought they had Jesus? Yeah, we got him finally. You know, how come, how come they said it was okay to, or you had to give them a certificate? And, and Jesus goes on again to talk about, um, he says, God only let you do that because your hearts were hard. That wasn't what God wanted. That wasn't what God wanted. So the importance of, I guess, marriage, we would call this, right? Uh, questions? Thoughts on what Jesus is saying here about divorce and marriage? So when one gets a divorce, and there are very obviously very valid reasons for such, yeah, do we just look at it like it was my sinful nature that, or our sinful nature that did not seem to let us get along, or 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 combine our philosophies of things, or keep each other loyal, and and think it was a, just a sin, it, not just a sin. It was a sin and God will forgive me. I mean, I mean, and make it, and it's just like any other sin. Right. Yes, I think. I mean, I feel like people need to be comforted that there are, you know, really reasons for a divorce. Like Absolutely. <clears throat> and, 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 and I think, I think you're right, Linda. I think that, um, that uh, one way to look at it is, is when divorce takes place, there's always sin involved. And, most often it's by both parties in some way or another, right? Uh, maybe it's not equal amounts of sin by both parties, but usually there's sin involved in both parties. Um, now, there's a rare occasion where maybe it's primarily one and not the other, and that happens, right? Um, and so, yeah, there's sin involved. And when there's sin involved, there's always grace available. And I think, yeah, absolutely. So those that have, and that's with all of these things Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, right? I think that Jesus covers such a wide variety of areas because he wants one of them to hit you in the heart and say, dog on it, I screwed up, <laughs> right? And where sin is involved, grace is available. And he wants you to come back then to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for yours is the kingdom of God. Yep, you screwed up. Yep, you failed. You're not good enough. You don't have enough. You're not strong enough. You can't handle this. Guess what? I love you anyway. And welcome to the kingdom. <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly what he wants us to do. So it's more like an acknowledging that it was sin and it weighs on you, but you know you have grace. Right. I mean, like like so many other things that we could talk about that we've done in our lives. Right. Or something. Right. Yeah. And I think with all sin, it's that you know there's there's receiving that grace, and then there's repentance involved as well, and. Um, Every once in a while, there's a story, and I had the privilege of being part of a couple of those uh, when I served in Minnesota, um, where a couple had divorced, uh, and probably for very valid reasons. There, I think there were issues of, of adultery in the marriage or issues of, of addiction um, and drug abuse, and so it wasn't a good situation, and so a divorce had taken place. And then after the divorce took place, both of the individuals um, kind of came to faith. They weren't really people of faith beforehand. They both came to faith. And there came a point after both of them came to faith that they were both still single. And, um, and they're like, okay, well, we're both still single. We're now people of faith. We're now different. And those issues we had before, we don't have those anymore. What do you think? And I had the privilege of being involved in the remarriage of two people like that. Um, and, and one of those, gosh, they'll be celebrating, or maybe just, just this year celebrated their 20th, um, would have celebrated their 20th wedding anniversary um after after that remarriage and and they're in a much different place and so things are different so that's that's kind of almost a sign of you know repentance hey we screwed up god's grace healed us and now we're in a position we can get remarried and 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 we can do that right this time so let's do it um now that's not always going to happen it doesn't always have to be the result but sometimes it, it is and sometimes it does yeah but there's always grace available And I think, again, one of these should hit close to home for all of us. If it's not the, 
uh, adultery and divorce issue, maybe it's going to be about oaths. Uh, because guess what? That's God hates that too, right? And that's just as serious. And God's not ranking these and saying, oh, this one's worse than this one. God's saying, no, this is all sin and this all needs to be taken care of in your life, right? And so he wants, uh, he wants us to realize that. So uh, verse 33 here, <coughs> um, he says this, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear on oath at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay. And so again, Jesus uses the same formula. You've heard it said, but I tell you. And here, the you've heard it said is, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Okay, again, that's the teachers of the law saying it. But this is the first time that those teachers of the law are not quoting the Old Testament. Okay, when they said, do not murder, do not commit adultery, give a certificate of divorce. Those were all quotes of Old Testament verses, right? This is not a direct quote of an Old Testament verse. But does that mean they're wrong? Okay. I mean, is this still, are they kind of on the right track? Don't break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. What do you think? Are they on the right track? I mean, absolutely, right? I mean, that's not a bad thing, right? Um, fulfill the vows you've made. Well, we should do that, right? We should do that. And there are certainly Old Testament verses we can look at as maybe evidence of that, right? but it's just not a direct quote, but they're not, they're not wrong. However, again, Jesus says, okay, you know, they're on the right track, but they don't have the full picture of what I expect of my people. I have the full picture of what I expect of my people. Um, what command, if we're, if we're kind of connecting these, the first two, your know, first three, you know, there were really, really a command connected there. Don't murder, don't commit adultery. Uh, which of the commandments might this be related to? Bear false witness. That could be one. Yep. Bear false witness, right? Um, he, uh, uh, so don't lie. If you make a vow, keep it. Don't lie. Keep your, keep your word. Um, the other one could be um, the second commandment. Um, um, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, right? Um, so it's, it's not just making sure you keep your vows, but how are you making those vows when you make them sort of thing, right? So there's really two commandments that could be involved here for the teachers of the law that they're looking at. So if you have to testify in court for one thing or another, you have to put your hand on the Bible and, yeah. and swear to yeah. tell the truth. Yes. But, um, and, but and, I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Yeah, and, and again, with all of these commandments, right, and we've said that, or, or with all of this on the Sermon on the Mount, we said that from the beginning, Jesus is not giving us a very legalistic, here's what you do, right? Again, going back to the, what we read about adultery, if that were the case, we'd have a bunch of people with eyes gouged out, right? So it's not a, here's what you do in each and every situation in life, no matter what, blanket statement, um, and so we have to say that about oaths because we know from elsewhere in scripture, um, I mean, Paul took an oath uh, later on in scripture, right? Um, and talks about oaths. So, so if, if this were a forbidding of every single oath ever, um, then there would be contradictions in scripture. So we don't believe that. Again, Jesus is, um, uh, you know, talking in, Again, this is kind of a sermon. So is, there's a rhetorical feature here and some exaggerations and, and not meant to be a legalistic sense, but guiding principles. I guess that's how the way we look at this, this is a guiding principle. There, there was a certain denomination or so when I was younger, I kept hearing about that they wouldn't like take uh, office in government. Exactly. They, they didn't want to. They, they wouldn't take an oath because you have to take an oath of office, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, I don't remember which Quakers or I don't know who it was. It might have been, yeah, yeah. And, and there have been over the years. In fact, in fact, at the time of the Reformation, uh, the Lutheran Church kind of struggled with this, and they're like, 
can a Christian, now that we're learning about the word and reading the word and learning about the gospel, can a Christian serve in political office? Because we have to take an oath of office, right? Is that okay? And Luther wrote about that and said, no, you, there, are, there are situations where, where we are called upon to take an oath, whether it's an oath of office. Um, how about marriage vows? Your marriage vows are an oath of sorts, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, you already referenced if you have to appear in court, right? You have to take an oath as you appear in court. And so, yeah, there are situations where we as Christians in good conscience can make an oath, right? Um, so it's, it's not forbidding necessarily all oaths. The problem too is, again, it helps to understand the context, right? They, in their day and age, um, they were, um, the big debate among the teachers of the, not debate among the teachers of the law, the way they practice oaths was they had this hierarchy of oaths, okay? Um, and I think when Jesus talks about by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem, that was part of the hierarchy they had. And, and they actually had the rules written down um, uh, that, that if you swore by Jerusalem, that meant that your oath was, you know, this strong. But if you swore by earth, that meant that your oath was even stronger. You were even more obligated to that oath. But if you swore by heaven, well, that, that oath is even stronger yet. And you're really obligated to that oath. Um, you know, and so, so that's what Jesus is combating here um, is this, this idea that, you know, you can swear by different things in this oath and, and depending on what you swear on is, is how strong your oath is. And um, um, that's, that's, Jesus is not, not forbidding all oaths altogether, but kind of the way they were doing it, the way they were practicing it and the way that worked. Yeah. You hear people say, well, I swear on my mother's grave. Yes. <laughs> um, is that actually swear uh, an oath? Yeah. I, 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 so is it, a, is it an oath by a technical sense? Uh, probably not by like a legal sense by any means, you know. Um, but I think it gets to what Jesus is talking about here, right? It, we, we feel this need uh, in, in each and every one of those situations. We feel this need to kind of back up my word with something else. Right. And ultimately, what Jesus is saying by all this is, I want your words just to be trustworthy. Your words matter. And when you say something, I want you to do it. I want you to follow through. I want your words to be trustworthy. I don't want you to have to swear by a bunch of stuff to provide power to your words. I want your words to carry that weight all by themselves as a disciple. That's really what Jesus is saying. So, yeah, I, th I think that example, though, Sharon, is exactly what they were doing. They just didn't use their mom's grave, they used Jerusalem and earth and heaven and and all these things, right? But they wouldn't, they were good Jews, so they wouldn't swear by the name of God, right? Because God says, don't take my name in vain. So they wouldn't swear by the name of God, but they would swear by heaven. You know, they wouldn't swear by the name of God, but they'd swear by earth. And what Jesus is saying here is if you're swearing by those things, what's he saying about heaven, earth, and Jerusalem? Those things all belong to God anyway. So if you think it's a big deal not to swear by God, but you'll swear by these things, Jesus says, that doesn't make any sense because those things belong to God anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then he also says, don't swear by your head. <laughs> um, and here I think he's referring to arrogance. You cannot even make one hair white or black. Well, we can actually do that today, right? You can go get a dye job and, and change the color of your hair if you'd like. So uh, we have the ability to do that. So I guess, let's see, Jesus, it doesn't apply to us, right? Um, no, I, I, here he's just talking about arrogance, right? Think that, that you're the, <laughs> kind of, you, you've got a big enough head to think that, uh, you, you know, uh, that you can do this when really you can't. Uh, and, and then verse 37 really talks about what he means in this whole section. What, all you need to say is simply yes or no. There's some translations say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you say yes, mean it. If you say no, mean it. Right? And people don't need you to swear by something because you're a trust, trustworthy person. And they know that if you say yes, you're going to follow through and you're going to do it. Right? That, that we as the people of God, <coughs> that our words should be trustworthy. Words are important and they should be able to be trusted. I think a lot of people that say, well, I swear this or I swear that, it's a habit of something. Sure. Oh, yeah. Just to try to make people think that 
Yeah, yeah believe me. Yeah. Believe me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, or trying to convince someone that I should be believable. And and I think what Jesus is saying, you shouldn't have to convince mm -hmm. anyone that you yeah. you're believable. You should just live a life and use your words in such a way that you are believable. And people don't ever have to question that. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, that's what he's saying about oaths. He's not saying don't ever take any vows. No, you're supposed to, you took marriage vows. Those were important. Those were significant. Those were okay, you know? And, and, and or you took a, another vow or another, you know, oath. You know, if you served in public office or in the military, right? You took an oath, you took a vow. That's okay. Just live up to it, mean it, right? Be faithful to it. That's what he's saying, yeah. You think... <clears throat> When mentioning these ways we use the, the comment, I swear it's kind of making us realize how trivial that is and how, and, and and referring to the context where you said there was a hierarchy that, and is that a comment on legalism, like where men sit around and say, well, there, there's an oath, but let's let's make it even fussier yeah. or something. I mean, God's word is fairly simple in, on this. Mm -hmm. in yeah. And, yeah. And, and they kind of, and if, if this, in large part, is a reaction to that context of the times. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there's a trivializing of things that takes place there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, God gave us the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Why do we need any other law on the face of the earth? Why can't we just live by these Ten Commandments? And then we don't have to have all this yeah and so there's a there's all this legalism and all these laws and sure and it, it's just the sinful flesh and now we need all these things well if we all if everybody would have just went by the ten commandments from the word go we wouldn't need any laws we wouldn't need any lawyers we wouldn't need any um police <clears throat> oh absolutely yeah we just live by those ten commandments let's say yeah, they can't do the world <laughs> Right. Yeah, we, we can't, can't and we don't. Them. Yeah. <laughs> In detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's it's the Ten Commandments and, and what they truly mean, you know, what God intended from them, right? That they, and this is what Jesus is saying. Here's what God intended from this, right? Um, it's it's the heart matter that matters. And and uh yeah, you can get all kinds of legalistic about this stuff and 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 in a sense that's that would be, I guess, adding to the words. You, say, you, know, you don't need to add to the words, just when, when you look at my words, my words are hard enough. You don't need to be adding stuff to it. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Makes me think of my mother used to say, never say never, <laughs> because we're all sinners and we're going to do some of these things that we say we'll never do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. Those uh, those words like never and always and yeah, you gotta be careful in using those words, right? Yeah. Um, I think this whole idea about words, though, you know, let it, words are important, and and let your word be your word. Um, boy, probably an important lesson for our day today. If Jesus were speaking the Sermon on the Mount in our world today, that might be the one that really hits close to home for a lot of people. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm not very careful with my words. Yeah. Our world is actually pretty careless when it comes to the use of our words, aren't we? Pretty careless. So, okay. I don't think we'll get into the next one. We'll leave it there for today. Any any kind of closing comments, thoughts, or questions on any of these that we covered? I just want to, this is kind of, doesn't pertain in a way, but when Ashley was in Africa, um, the way they got around divorce, and, you know, they weren't getting along, they would put a, their wife in another village and marry someone else. And so um, Ashley said, you know, it's kind of hard to, combat but that was their interpretation wow yeah and so the, and like they're a missionary that she knew his dad had like four or five wives and 
And she said, well, why do they, if you have them all in different villages? And he said, you can't keep all your wives in the same village. They never get along. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. But wow. anyway, that was just a, a practice that they had, but they thought they were kind of get, in their way getting around. Uh-huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And we're like that as humans, right? We want to try and get a get around the rules we'd like to look for the loopholes right what are the loopholes and and i think that's what the teachers of the law did they looked for the loopholes that's what we as humans do we look for the loopholes why because we know we can't live up to it and instead of looking for the loopholes jesus wants us to admit you can't live up to it right whatever it is you can't live up to it um and i think as we read as as we listen to this sermon right these words of jesus he wants us to realize i can't live up to it oh man my words do fall short oh man, I haven't kept my word. Oh, I blew that again. And then when we do, what do we do? We go back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And what did Jesus say? Blessed are the poor in spirit for yours is the kingdom of heaven. He wants us to remember we're part of the kingdom of heaven, not because I used my right words and not because I stayed married and not because I didn't commit murder. That's not why I'm part of the kingdom of heaven. I'm part of the kingdom of heaven in spite of the fact I didn't do those things right. And I am blessed even though I'm poor in spirit by the grace of God. And so we come back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and then we come back through and try and do better next time, <laughs> right? And I know I wasn't here for this, but is the definition of poor in spirit um, aware that I'm a sinner? Yeah, kind of spirit, uh, poor in, in spirit, spiritually. Yes, that awareness that, that I have nothing to offer to God. I am, I am completely spiritually bankrupt. Yeah, yep, that realization of sin. I think God calls you to repent. God calls you to repentance now, but it's not like um, it's not like God puts a, a, a starts the stopwatch. I call you to repent, and He starts a stopwatch. And if you don't repent after X number of hours or X number of days, then you're in trouble. Yeah, no, that's it's an open ended call to repentance. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, he, he wants you to do it as soon as you recognize it and realize it. And obviously that's part of our growth to the, as, and the faith. But sometimes we are blinded and we're stuck and we're stubborn. And, you know, sometimes it takes us a while. But thankfully, God's grace is still available. And that's the key. Yeah, God's grace is still available. All right, well, let's close with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you um, again for gathering us around your word, and we thank you for this word today. Um, it's, it's important, Lord, for us to know what you expect of us. You've, you've given us a blueprint for what our lives look as your disciples, and um, we admit as we hear this blueprint that we fall short. We don't always measure up to your expectations. When that's the case, we ask that you would forgive us. Bring us back to uh, admitting that we are but poor in spirit and receiving the blessing that comes by being a part of your kingdom by grace, through faith, through the work of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for that. We pray that now as your forgiven children, you would help us to live according to your expectations, that you would help our yes to be yes, our no to be no. Help us take our words seriously. Help us take marriage seriously. Um, help us, Lord, uh, clean up that, that heart by the working of your Holy Spirit within us. As we head out our separate ways today, we pray that you would go with us, that you would guard, keep, and protect us in your care. Be with those who couldn't join us today, and uh, I pray that you would gather all of us again back soon to continue study your, your word, growing in your faith, and uh, being encouraged by the word of the gospel that you offer to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.